Okay, today we're going to talk about cognition, chapter four in the Fast Track book. Now, just to kind of set the stage, this is one of the larger chapters that we're going to go through. So this could be a little bit of a longer presentation, as it will take us a few extra days in school to uh, go through the material. But cognition, obviously, to start it off, involves thinking. Now, thinking by formal definition is cerebral management of information received from our senses. So we receive information from our senses, and then we simply put it into thought, and that's often involving perception. Perception is how we interpret events, and how we interpret events is simply being done in the cerebral cortex, which is, so to speak, the CPU of our brains. Now, reaction time is often very important, what psychologists look at when they study the ways that we think or our cognitive abilities. And reaction time is how quickly we come up with an answer after we see a presentation of a stimulus. So when we see a problem, how fast we solve that problem indicates our level of thinking or our measure of intelligence. Now, some things that can affect it just you know affect our reaction time to answer these questions: complexity, you know how difficult the situation is, expectancy, expecting to hear a loud noise. So if you have like some type of preview of a problem or someone forewarns you that this is going to be a hard concept, uh, stimulus response, camp, uh, compatibility, hot water causes you to turn off the faucet car accidents are more sudden, it's just simply that's prior experience. So we understand that when we someone tells us it's cold water, then we are already prepared in our mind in terms of our response. Speed accuracy, a lot of times we often answer too fast and we make you know mistakes when we try to you know look at how quickly we can answer the question. Now in terms of the brain and reaction time, the frontal lobes is responsible for short-term memory. Okay, and short-term memory, when we talk about it throughout this chapter, is simply what we're working with at a given moment. The hippocampus is after a task, be uh, after a task becomes more familiar or done a number of times, then the hippocampus is mainly activated. This is the response. This is responsible for the formation of long-term explicit memories. So, in other words, our phone number. Since our phone number, when we first learned it to be in process in the frontal lobes, so obviously that's short-term memory. We haven't committed our phone number, our new phone number, to long-term memory. But after a period of time of dialing our phone number, then simply the hippocampus is being more active. Okay? Now, on this chart right here is some basic ingredients of thought. Okay? Concept is a mental category. Okay? We have concepts are like file folders, right? So your parents have probably you know folders in their uh, filing drawer. One marked insurance, one marked you know, mortgage, one marked you know, car payments, and so on. So in other words, in our brain, we organize information into concepts. And concepts are based on familiarity. So all cars would be a concept. Schoolwork would be a concept. Foods would be a concept. All right? So we separate all the information that we come encounter with into concepts. Now, prototype is simply your best example. What comes to your mind first? So when I say cars, whatever car came to your mind first is your prototype. And prototype is your best example. It's your most typical example. So in this example, probably for everybody in this room, a Dodge Charger would be your prototype of your concept of cars and concept mental category. Now, concepts can be broken into two parts. Formal concept is a concept that is defined by a set of rules, like a triangle. In order for something to be classified as a triangle, it has to meet the rule. And the rule is it has to have three sides, just like a square has to have four sides. Natural concepts are concepts that are formed through everyday experiences. You have formed concepts of like, or concept of dogs, for example, from just simply your experience of being with dogs. Now, just to tie in what we talked about with chapter three, assimilation and accommodation is simply the information going in. So the more dogs you come into contact with, you are assimilating more information into your concept of category. So, when you look at that kind of introduces schema. Schema is a mental framework that helps organize information. It's kind of what defines these concepts. Okay? So in other words, a mental organization of a car, you simply know it has doors, it has tires, it has an engine. It's your automatic thoughts. When I say car, whatever automatic thoughts came to your mind, that's the framework. All right? So it's kind of like an outline, so to speak. Now, script is you know, another example of a schema. Okay? But it's a sequence of events. For example, you have a script for how you get ready in the morning. Okay? It's a step-by-step -step procedure. You have a script for how you get ready for school. 
And simply a script is a routine that you've done over and over. So like a schema is a mental framework that you've just come in contact with over time and you form this framework. A script just involves the steps or the routine that's involved, okay? Shooting a basket, hitting a golf ball, and so on. Now, mental model is a mental representation, like a visual, of a situation, event, or an object. Now, if, you know, for example, if you came in contact with a dog that growled at you or snapped at you, then simply your mental visual image, when I say dog to you down the road, would be of a dog growling. So in other words, a mental model is like a snapshot. It's like the visual image that you have. So if I say car, a lot of times people see a car. All right, It's usually their prototype, what they see the most. Now, cognitive map, okay, which is a concept that you're going to see in the, uh, the learning chapter, is a mental representation of an environment. What an example of a cognitive map is, if I said to you right now, picture your house, you would have a map of your house. You would know the bedrooms, you would know the downstairs, what's in the drawers, what's in the kitchen. It's a mental map. You know, a good idea of a cognitive map is Google Maps, all right, or some of your cars come with navigation. That's literally what a mental map is. Now, you have a mental map of Sterling Heights, so that's why most of the time you do not turn on your navigation in this area because you can basically see 15-mile road, 16-mile road. You can picture yourself driving throughout Sterling Heights. You go to a less familiar area, like up north, then, yeah, you have to use Google Maps or you're going to have to use a navigation unit. Now, Typical question from that chart. When asked to give an example of what a bird is, Tom replied, do you mean a robin? For Tom, a robin is an example of. Now, obviously, robin is the first thing that came to his mind. Is that an algorithm, mental set, concept, prototype, or a script? Now, most of you, when I said the first thing to come to your mind, or your best example, which in this case is robin, we'd be talking about prototype. Another question is, Mr. Flanders asked Sean to deliver a message to Mrs. Rogers. Sean has never been to Mrs. Rogers' room, but is told that it is two classrooms to the right of Mr. Smith's room. Because Sean had been had Mr. Smith last year for psychology, he knows where Mrs. Rogers' classroom is. Sean has used what component of thought to help him? So in other words, here's kind of the clue. Sean can see, so to speak, the layout of the school. Okay, he can picture where rooms are. Now, most of you looking at the answers is that cognitive map, script, functional fixedness, mental set or algorithm. Most of you would have, uh, you know, right away because it's obviously he's talking about the map of a location. The right answer is a cognitive map. Now, in terms of thinking strategies, that's broken into two different branches. Formal reasoning, okay, or reasoning I should say just as an introduction, is simply a cognitive process, okay, to reach a decision. And the two types are formal and informal. So reasoning is how you come up with answers. Okay, and there's a very specific way you sometimes come up with answers, and then there's simply, you know, an assumption or, you know, a word of mouth or something that you rely on informally to come up with answers. Formal reasoning, which is also called deductive reasoning, is used to justify a conclusion based on the truth of the premise or logical rules. This is rigid. This is, you know, A equals B equals C. It is, it is written out and almost into laws, okay? So in other words, you know, width, you know, or I mean area, stuff like that. That is all simply defined by length times width and so on. It's rigid. Now, premises, just like simply a formal type of reasoning skill. A premise would be all dogs have tails. Well, Cody is a dog, therefore he has a tail. A premise is simply a way of saying it, a way of, of law of looking at it. Now, algorithm is a systematic procedure. It's a step-by-step -step procedure used to guarantee a correct solution to a problem. The key thing with an algorithm is if you use it step-by-step, -step, you are guaranteed a solution. The only drawback and why a lot of people don't use algorithms is they're time-consuming. Okay? If you wanted to guarantee that you bought everything in a store, in a grocery store, an algorithm would have you go aisle by aisle by aisle. Okay. Now, most people don't have the time to go aisle by aisle by aisle, and so they rely on something else, which we'll get to. Now, typical question, Clarice goes to the store to purchase chips for her upcoming graduation party. Which problem-solving strategy would ensure that Clarice finds the aisle containing the chips? Ensure means guarantee. Now, we just went over that, so would it be a representative heuristic, availability heuristic, a mental set, incubation, or algorithm. And again, step by step guarantees a solution. That is, 
course logarithm. Now, informal reasoning is probably typically what you guys use the most of. Okay? Partly because it's shortcut and it's quick. All right? Informal reasoning, which is called inductive reasoning, is used to form a conclusion based on the believability or accessibility of information, as well as the amount of effort you want to put in. Now, if all dogs you have seen had tails, and then you saw a dog that did not have a tail, you would conclude it's not a dog, okay? Because simply you're making a very quick assumption, and that's often what informal reasoning is, it's assumptions, all right? You don't take the time to research all different types of dogs, which you will later find out if you did that, that not, some dogs don't have a tail. Now, heuristic is a rule of thumb or cognitive shortcut that's used in place to an algorithm. It saves time. The problem is it does allow for quick decisions, but it does not, it's not always accurate. It's not always going to guarantee a solution. So an example of my grocery store, a heuristic would be you go to this, you go to certain aisles, you skip other aisles. Okay? Now you save time, but obviously if you skip some aisles, you might not remember that you needed certain items. Okay? Same thing like an algorithm, we'll give you one more example. An algorithm would be like a Yahoo map that you follow step by step by step. A heuristic would be like in the first several steps that if you, you know, chose not to, you know, for example, you knew a shortcut how to get quicker to 22 mile road, then you might, you know, use a heuristic and save some time. But obviously you save some time, there could be an example that you're going to make a mistake and miss a turn on. Alright, now, there's two types of heuristics. And these are key that you're going to have to know throughout the course because we always are going to make reference to them in certain chapters. Availability heuristic. Remember, heuristic is shortcut, right? So availability heuristic is a shortcut based on the available information that you have at a given time. Now, you probably need a little bit more detail to that. Availability heuristic is pretty much what you know the most of at a given point. So you, for everything, you're not experts at all. You only have a certain amount of available information for certain topics. So a lot of times it's limited. So if I ask you a question, okay, what is more common, breast cancer or cervical cancer? Because you know more, you have more available information about breast cancer, and breast cancer is the first thing that comes to your mind, you would probably answer that question by saying breast cancer. But in all honesty, the answer is cervical cancer. So this is why people advertise. This is why schools send you information. Because the more information you know about something, not only would it increase your available information, but it will also be the first thing that comes to your mind. So if you have to make a choice, you know, you look at when do colleges send you information. They send you information at the point where they know you're going to fill out applications. So you're more prone because availability heuristic is the first information that comes to your mind. You're more prone to pick something that you know the most about at a certain point, at the present time. Representativeness heuristic is another type of heuristic. And this deals with the definition we talked about prototype. Representative heuristic is your decision. Okay, is based on how well the present information in front of you matches your prototype. Prototype is your best example of a category. So let's look at that. And this is something, you may have never heard the term representative heuristic, but you do it all the time. So if somebody says to you, do you like, do you like pizza? Okay, what you would do if you said yes or no using a representative heuristic is you would measure that, how well pizza represents your prototype, your prototype food, which let's say is, you know, spaghetti. So it matches well, so you say, yes, I like pizza. Now, if somebody says, you like asparagus, asparagus doesn't represent your prototype very well. It doesn't match your prototype of what you consider good food. So you'd probably say, no, ooh, I don't like it. A lot of times, <coughs> where people use representative heuristic is to buy things. So they go, you know, when people are disappointed, if someone buys them a gift, and they're disappointed, it's because it doesn't match their prototype. It doesn't represent their prototype of what they want or what, uh, what is considered a good gift to them. Now, here's a good question. Which of the following best describes the use of availability heuristic? Okay. Jack believes that all secretaries are women. Sam is completing a mathematical problem step by step. Andrea falls to turn in her, fails to turn in her assignment thinking it is due tomorrow. Steve believes that more injuries occur in hockey than in baseball. Angelica thinks that Bulldogs are the best example of a dog. Now, give you a little time while you're figuring this out. Remember, availability heuristic, ask yourself. Heuristic, shortcut. Available information at a given time. What comes to your mind first? What you know the most about? Obviously, this kind of comes down to that Steve knows more about hockey 
than he does other sports. So he's going to naturally occur that it's, you know, simply more injuries happen there. Let's say people get paid more there because that's all he knows about. That's his available information when it comes to sports. Now, another example, okay, of heuristic is an anchoring and adjustment heuristic. Not, you know, as, not as common as Bill to the representative, but still there. Anchoring and heuristic is a rule of thumb that relies on a starting reference point, okay, an anchoring point, okay. So in other words, you anchor a boat, that's like a starting spot, but the boat can still float from the anchor. But it, it really, it starts right there. Where does it start to float? From the anchor. So often, just to just give you a better example of this, is you grow up in your house. So your first exposure to information about any topic is your parents. So your parents start a point of your thinking. A lot of times let's use political beliefs. So you have an anchoring point that starts with what your example of politics is. Now when you come to school, why it's called anchoring and adjustment is often when you're exposed to more information, you're going to have to adjust that anchor. All right? You simply have to go further with it. A good example of anchoring and adjustment heuristic a lot of times is biases. People have a bias. They have an anchor. Okay? Now, just to kind of you know, review this, representative heuristic is, again, how well it matches your prototype. Availability heuristic is you only know so much about certain topics, so you only have a certain amount of available information to make a decision. That's why, and one more example on availability heuristic, that's why car, car salesmen will often ask you questions about cars. If they realize you don't know that much about it, they're probably going to be able to sell you more. Okay? Now, problem solving, okay, we use several techniques. Means end analysis is a problem solving technique that relies on the identification of a final goal and required steps needed to achieve that goal. So in other words, this is kind of like having little goals that build up to the big goal. So let's say the final goal, means to an end analysis, would be graduating from high school. And then you would simply, that would be the overall goal. But you'd have sub-goals. You have to get you know, good grades in your core classes. You have to take phys ed. You have to take you know, language. So they would be sub-goals that would help you reach the final goal. Okay? So a lot of times, like you know, for example, marathon training, it is sub-goals that lead up to it. I'll start out running 10 miles, then I'll start to run 12 and 14. You're building up to the final goal of 26.2 miles. Now, analogies is obviously something I use in class a lot. It's finding similar similarities between a current problem and prior problems. So when a teacher says, it was like the time that you did this, or it's like when you, you know, try to uh, figure out how to pick you know, your lineup for your fantasy league. They try to make connections between a current problem that's in the classroom and prior problems. So I always teach through analogies. The more that I can make you related to other things, the more you can simply relate it to the current problem. Now, incubation, which you probably have never heard of that word, is most of you have done this. When you get writer's block or you can't think of something or you can't figure out a problem, you walk away from it. You call a friend, you go outside, you watch TV, but you step back from that problem. Then you come back to that problem two hours later. And then when you come with a fresh set, and you kind of get your mind out of like a mental set. So in other words, like what happens is if you're trying to solve a problem, you're probably making the same mistake over and over. Because your brain's rigid. It's set on that way to solve the problem. Incubation allows, so to speak, to reset. So it's like restarting your computer. All right? When you restart your computer, it's no longer locked on a specific way to answer a question. Now, <coughs> the insight is the sudden realization, okay, or sudden, you know, solution. We say, aha, I got it. That's often the result of incubation. <coughs> so when you're watching TV, then all of a sudden it hits you. I forgot to add the one. That's an example of insight, okay? And then you go back and solve the problem, and you kind of kick yourself because you made the same mistake like 20 times in a row. So incubation is a very useful problem-solving technique. Now, typical question that would be correlated to that, Jillian is struggling with a challenging physics problem. She can't seem to solve. Which problem-solving strategy would she benefit from? Okay? So obviously most of you are saying, well, she should get up and take a break. Well, which one of those words is get up and take a break? Most of you would have chose incubation. Okay? Taking a step back from it. Now, obstacles to problem-solving, and I kind of alluded to this earlier. A mental set has a tendency to approach a new problem the same way it's worked in the past. This is a good example of mental set, or word I should say, is stubborn. Some people are stubborn. Now I could use, you know, simply for example the story problem. They solve problems the same way, even if the problem's different, they try to rely on past story problem techniques. 
So, in other words, they don't adapt. But some people use this in life. I mean, some people, for example, they ask somebody out the same way that they've done for the past several times because it was successful. Even though it's outdated or, you know, it's just simply of the past, they still rely on it because one day it worked. Good example of mental status. Some people have kind of like a lucky shirt or a lucky outfit that they wear out when they go out because when they wore this shirt, you know, they were able to meet somebody. Well, hopefully they washed that shirt, but more likely that was just by chance, by coincidence, but they think that there was something to it. Now, functional fixedness is a term that you'll constantly hear in this class. It is the inability to see that an object has more than one purpose other than the one it was originally designed for. So, for example, a dime is used for money. But also, if somebody was experiencing functional fixedness, they would realize that they could use a dime to turn a screw because they only see a dime as you know, a form of currency. You know, another example with this would be somebody who puts their head on the ground and doesn't realize that they could have used their backpack for a pillow because they only see their backpack with the original purpose to carry things in. Now, <clears throat> confirmation bias is another obstacle, obviously. But this is a tendency to only accept information that supports our beliefs. Probably more than likely everybody in this room uses confirmation bias. We, we know what people are going to say ahead of time. And that's why we call certain people up. We know they're going to agree with us. A lot of times we're not going to call somebody or ask a person for advice that if simply they're going to disagree with us. So if somebody has this confirmation bias or somebody has this thought that all women are bad drivers, then simply they're only going to pay attention to people that support their viewpoint. So if somebody says, well, actually men get into more accidents, they're going to ignore it. They're going to block it out. Right? You're going to hear what, you know, really confirmation bias is you hear what you want to hear. Okay? Now, good question here. Which of the following demonstrates the principle of confirmation bias, which we just covered? Okay? After learning that her friend was depressed, Julie says, of course she was depressed. She never wanted to do anything. Joe is passionate about environment conservation and refuses to listen to read any data that contradicts his views. Interesting. Carly hears that the new English teacher loves to read books and attends plays, then she assumes the teacher is female. Erica is trying to solve physics problems but cannot think of which equation to use to do so, and instead begins her math homework. Samantha wants to eat a can of soup but does not have a can opener, so she uses a knife to cut a hole in the soup can. Most of you, I think, right away got the answer, and that was B, because obviously the guy only wants to hear what he wants to hear when it comes to the topic he believes in. Okay? Now, many students, okay, another question here, tend to miss the multiple choice questions that state which of the following does not apply to a given question. Their failure to notice a differently worded question, such as an example of which obstacle to problem solving, what would that be an example of? Is it functional fixedness? I don't think so. We're not talking about an object. Mental set? Seems interesting. Algorithm? It's not a step-by-step. -step. Confirmation bias? That deals with your opinions and viewpoints. Or incubation, which is stepping back. Most of you would have put mental set. You simply you get into a habit. You don't notice the word accept in a question. So every time you see a multiple choice question, you approach it the same way. That's why you have to you make dumb mistakes on tests. You use the same mental set for every type of question, even though the question may be worded slightly different. Now, decision making involves several principles. Each option or decision has a factor known as a utility. Now, it's a measurement of satisfaction received by choosing that option. Okay? So in other words, a good example here, utility would be simply the measuring point that you are going to use to make the decision whether the person you went out with was a good date or not a good date. The utility is if they kiss you, they met, they met the utility, then you simply would say that's a good date. If they didn't kiss you because they didn't meet that utility, that measurement of satisfaction that you basically said in your mind, you would call it a bad date. Now, gambler's fallacy is interesting because a lot of people use this, especially in casinos is the belief that the probability of random sequence is influenced by preceding behavior. So wearing a certain colored sock, wearing a certain colored socks before a game determines a win. This is superstition, all right? And some people use it. Some people when they take tests use their favorite pencil or they have an eraser that they always put on the right side of their desk. So in other words, if you got an A on a test, you're going to have a tendency just to repeat every little thing you did to get that A the next time because you believe that had some type of bearing on it. Now, Framing effect influences the decision by altering the words. Okay, and here's a good example. A lot of us, you know, we, we often fall for this. If somebody says 95% fat free, 
okay? They focus on the fat free. But if you said 5% fat, then you'd focus on the fat part and you'd probably make a different decision about eating whatever it was, even though it's the same thing. You're saying it just differently. So if a teacher says to you 90% of students pass this course, you focus on the pass part and it makes you feel good. If they said 10%, which is essentially the same thing, fail the course, you focus on the fail and you would have a different thought about taking that class. Now, language is the next category. So obviously we did thinking, language, and then the last part's memory. And that's why if you want to take a break, this would be a good point. Now language is simply the characteristics that se separate human beings from animals, right? Our ability to communicate using a certain type of language that's made up of certain rules. Syntax and semantics are examples. Those are rules regarding the structure of grammar and its meaning. Semantics is the meaning of words. Syntax is the structure, noun before verb and so on. Now, infinite and creativity, ability to generate an infinite number of senses, that separates us, you know, from animals. Right? Animals basically do not have the creativity or the foresight to see things like we do. Displacement is the ability to communicate events in the future or in the past. So in other words, you're able to talk about the future and make reference to the past as well as the present. Animals, again, can't do that. Now, <clears throat> according to psychologists, what distinguishes true language from the language produced by lower animals? Syntax, semantics, morphemes, and phonemes. Plasticity, syntax, and semantics, infinite creativity. Syntax, semantics, infinitive creativity, displacement. Syntax and semantics, infinitive creativity, and counterproduction, whatever that is. Syntax and semantics, infinitive creativity, and displacement. Now, most of you have said E. This is what separates from animals. Our structure of sentences, our meaning of words, our ability to generate ideas, and our simply our ability to talk about the past, present, and future. Now, moving on to the next part, okay, language and its elements. These are the building blocks of our language. Okay? Most of you probably covered it in an English class or so on. Phonemes are the smallest unit of sound. Okay? The vowels, consonants. Morphemes are the smallest units of meaning. So I always say, remember it like this, because most people mix, mix these two up. There's more to a morpheme. What do I mean by more to a morpheme? It has meaning. Then a phoneme. A phoneme is, again, the simplest sounds, consonants, vowels. Obviously, add, when you add it to a word, it changes the meaning. All right? It's small, but it changes the meaning. Now, syntax, again, like I said earlier, is the rules with the associated with the organization of the sentence. Verb is always followed by noun and so on. Semantics is the meaning of the sentence. Okay? Obviously, when you look here, two, two, and two all have different meanings. Now, understanding speech, this brings up chapter two, which we did a few days ago. Wernicke's area is the part of the brain responsible for turning audible words into speech. Okay? Now, human vision also plays a role. So, in other words, Wernicke's area is simply our understanding of what's being said to us. Now, McGurk effect is a combination of hearing and vision that allows us to understand speech. So, in other words, we not only have to hear it, but we have to also visualize it. Okay? And it's hard when, you know, for example, some people have difficulties when their hearing or their, their vision is impaired. Okay, the McGurk effect is simply combining what we hear and visualizing what we hear and making it into a thought. We use both senses on that. Now, in terms of development of language, okay, the first year okay, is kind of characterized by the babbling stage and the one word stage. Babbling stage is what it means. They just babble consonants. They battle, in other words, a good review here, they battle phonemes. One word stage is they basically say one word. Now, when I say that's easy to understand, but when I say the overextension of words, a lot of times da has 50 different meanings. They use one word for many different things. Da can mean mom, it can mean dad, it can be dog, it can be food. They say da over and over. We don't know what it means because they have 50 different you know, meanings for it. Now, second year is characterized by the two word stage. And that's obviously they're using two words, you know, daddy go, okay? Well, the thing is, this is about 18 months to two years. Vocab increases, and the chart, you know, the children start to string words together like a telegraph. That's why it's characterized by telegraphic speech. Want juice. They're like giving direction. They're telegraphing their thoughts. Daddy, go. Mommy, here. Okay? They're giving telegraph or, you know, direction. Like a telegram is often very limited words, and it basically kind of gives a lot of times meaning, but also a direction. Now, 
three-word stage is just simply they start adding another word to their sentence. Not much dramatic. Overregularization is a lot of times misapplication of the rules of grammar. So syntax here. They'll say, I sit it down. I, you know, I stand it up. All right, they're, they don't know too many words, so they a lot of times can't change words. Like, sit it would be sad, obviously, okay? And they don't know that, and that's over-regularization. They just don't understand syntax. Now, third stage, which is the woo words. This is by age three. I mean, anybody that has a brother or sister that's three years old, you're going to hear why over and over. Who, what? They, they talk like they're a reporter, okay? Why, 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 why? Now, Good question from here. One-year-old Hayden points out to points to a horse and says, Dougie. Hayden is displaying again. He uses Dougie for a number of things. So what is that an example of? Over-regularization, telegraphic speech, overextension, incubation or babbling. And in other words, most of you would have said C, overextension. They're overextending the word, overusing Dougie. That's a good way to remember it. Now, two theories of language development brings in our nature-nurture debate again. And you guys you know, again, nature-nurture is over and over. So nature is, you know, that so it's genetically based, and nurture is it's environmentally based. Now, on the nurture side of things, which is behavioral, okay, and this is obviously the Watson and everything has to be observed, so they have to be observed in the environment. B.F. Skinner said language is developed by reinforcement and imitation. We learn to talk in the environment the nurture side of it, by watching our parents say words. Now, there's a problem with this one. This theory cannot account for words that are incorrectly imitated. Some people, for example, who have parents that speak perfect, you know, English, and then the child develops a speech impediment, they didn't get that speech impediment from watching their parents talk, because their parents obviously talk very accurately. So you have to look at the genetic side of things that people are born with certain ways to talk. Okay, whether it's dialogue or dialect, whether it's you know speech impediments or you know the way we talk. Now, this brings in the work of Noam Chomsky, the genetic side of language development. He believed in something called universal universal grammar, is that this is innate knowledge. So we come with this predetermined way to talk, and that's called universal grammar. Now this is kind of supported by the critical period of theory of development. Remember, critical period is that certain things have to happen by a certain time. For language development, it's around 12. If a child doesn't learn to talk, then this universal grammar that they came equipped with, kind of what, if you want to look at it this way, expires. So you have to use it. It's like a gift card. You have to use it by year 2013. If you don't, then it's gone. That's the same thing. So every gift card has a critical period. So does language development. Now, Benjamin Whorf, which this one a lot of people have problems with, believed that where you live could play a role in language development. And I believe in that. And obviously it does, because people have different meanings and different words they use all across this earth. Now, linguistic determinism was his theory, or it's been called linguistic relativity theory. It states that culture dictates language, and language dictates thought. Now, a good example is American culture puts a tremendous amount of influence all right, on the word time. In other words, we have so many different words that express time. Minutes, seconds, hours, days, months. Okay? In fact, Americans often measure things in times. You know, if I ask a student, how did you, you, know, you do on the test? They often tell me, I don't know, but I studied five hours. Everything is an assessment. You ask somebody when they're going out in high school with another person. Hey, how's your relationship? Great, we've been going out five months. So not, uh, not every culture emphasizes time we do. So time, obviously the American culture dictates our use of time, which dictates the way we think about things, how we measure things. Okay? Obviously, you know, for example, if you guys lived in Alaska, the Inuits okay, have a lot of different words for snow. Down here in Michigan, <coughs> we may just have a couple, wet snow, fine snow. Up there, they have many different words of snow, because obviously you know, their culture you know, is around that. Now, the last part, so again, if you want to take a break, the last part of this deals with memory. Now, memory refers to the mental process needed to acquire, retain, and retrieve information. Okay, and this is a big part of the chapter. Now, encoding is simply how we enter information into memory. So it's like typing on a keyboard. How you type the words is how it's going to be simply stored in your Word document. You type them wrong, they're going to be stored wrong. Okay? 
Storage is simply kind of very similar to save apps or save on the computer. So if you have a Word document that you type, when you hit that word save, you bring it up tomorrow, that same document's going to come up. You save information to long-term memory, that information is going to be in your long-term memory whenever you need it. Now, retrieval is simply like hitting open. Okay, and open is, you know, simply just taking the information out of long-term memory or taking the information out of a word, you know, a word file. Now, the process of acquiring information and entering it in memory is referred to what, what did I say is typing on the keyboard like? Storage, encoding, retrieval, gathering, stimulation. And the answer is encoding, how you put the information in, encode it, put it into code. Now, on the next part, models of memory, parallel distributed model. I mean, this is a good model. New information is integrated with existing memories, resulting in changing a person's overall knowledge base. A good example of a PD, you know, M model or parallel distributed model is, for example, assimilation, which we use that word, building up on schemas. Schemas are simply making network connections between different events. So often when you hear, like if I said, William James was the father of American psychology, you, you form a memory of that. But if I also say he wrote, you know, or, you know, led into functionalism, you're adding that to the memory you already have about William James. So it goes into your concept, okay, which we talked about, which was a mental category in the beginning of this chapter. Now, then again, if, if, if I just bring up another term, if someone said, who's your favorite psychologist, and you said William James, that would be your prototype. Now, the information processing model, which was also called or referred to by the people who wrote it, Atkinson and Schifrin, is that it says memory must go through three stages. All right, this is probably one of the most talked about or viewed memory models because as I go through this, you're going to be able to relate to it because obviously you all have memories sitting in here. Now, what it says is it must go through sensory, short-term memory, and finally in the long-term memory. Now, each stage is limited. Sensory memory is limited, short-term memory is limited, and long-term memory is also affected by limitations. Now, George Sperling studied sensory memory. Now what he did was he presented a series of 12 letters and four roles for a brief moment. Okay, and they were random letters. Now, everyone saw the letters on the screen, but they could only remember four or five. They couldn't remember all 12 letters. And what it showed was he concluded that sensory memory is very, very brief. Okay, and actually, visual sensory memory, also called iconic memory, is very brief. It's less than a second. Okay, now obviously visual sensory memory is very short. The reason why visual sensory memory or iconic memory is so much shorter than auditory is because there's so much to see. It's our dominant sense. It's called visual clip. I mean, we just, or visual capture. It's our dominant sense. Auditory, why it lasts longer? Because it takes us longer to say words verbally than it is to look at something in a book, uh, you know, in terms of visually. Now, short-term memory is simply what we're working with at a given moment. Okay? Now, short-term memory is what we're thinking about. So in other words, short-term memory is right, what's right in front of you presently. Now, working memory refers to the process of how we work, for, how we work with information within the short-term memory category. So short-term memory is what we're working with. How we're working with that information is what's called working memory. So it's, it goes together with short-term. So people that have good working memory processes, in other words, they're able to pay attention when there's a lot of noise, they're able to focus and not get distracted as much, which obviously that improves their short-term memory. Now, short-term memory is only for about 20 or 30 seconds. You have about 20 or 30 seconds to figure out what it is that you're thinking about. After that, if you stop thinking about it, then it's gone. Now, there are ways to improve the duration. Maintenance rehearsal is simply repeating, you know, the information over and over to keep it active in short-term memory longer. This is how some kids study for a test. They repeat a term over and over, get the test really quick, answer the questions before time is up. Good example of maintenance rehearsal is like people that stick, you know, uh, coins into a meter. The more coins they stick into a meter, the longer they can park there, right? They're maintaining their parking spot for a longer period of time way to remember that. Now, George Miller stated that short-term memory is listed, limited in capacity. 
Capacity means storage, and it's limited to the magic number seven plus or minus item or plus or minus two items. So most of you can think about or retain seven items in short-term memory at one time. Now there is ways to increase the capacity. Okay, one of those techniques is chunking. It's how we group items. Okay, what's an example of chunking? An acronym. Most people will remember the five great lakes. Okay, by Holmes, here on Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. Now, you've increased, all right, that's one item now. So you took five items, chunked it into one item. Okay, now, long term memory is pretty much limitless, right? There is no capacity. You know, you can store a lot of stuff up there. Most of you do have a lot of stuff up there. There's no need to empty it or delete files because it just keeps on growing. Now, Encoding information, remember encoding means putting in. So how does information get from short term to long term memory? Well, the bottom line is, it's called the level of processing theory. When information involves a deeper and more meaningful type of processing, it will last for a longer duration of long term memory. Well, I'm sure it gets there. That's a good example of elaborative rehearsal, is the application of personal meaning and understanding. The reason why when I teach you, I try to give you so many examples, is the more meaningful the term is, if it you know, simply jumps off the page and becomes a part of your life, or you can relate to it. In other words, if I elaborate on a term, elaborate, adding more to it, there's a greater chance you're going to provide personal meaning towards it, and it's going to go to long-term memory. Okay? So again, just to review this, how does what goes from sensory to short-term memory? What encodes memories in the short term is simply we pay attention. So if you hear a sound, you pay attention to it, then it moves into short-term memory. You start thinking about what that sound is, trying to make sense out of it. Now the point is, if you have a lot of people talking to you or a lot of things going on, you can only think about about seven items at one time in short-term memory. So after about 20 or 30 seconds, if you don't make sense out of that sound, it's gone. Now, if you provide some meaning to that sound, let's say it's a, weird, a very weird sound. In other words, you elaborate on that sound and give it meaning. One of the weirdest sounds you ever heard. Then you're going to talk about the rest of your day because it's in long-term memory. If the sound didn't have any meaning to it, it was just a bump and it went away, you thought about it in short-term memory, but you did not give it enough meaning to move it to long-term memory. Now, there are types of long-term memory. Explicit memories, or they're called declarative memories, require conscious thinking. Okay? This is a tough part of the lecture. You've got to know these differences. Explicit memories require explicit thoughts or explicit actions. You've got to make an effort to remember it. Now, some of the most you know, common explicit memories are facts and figures, schoolwork, phone numbers, names of people, addresses. All right? But if I said, what's your phone number? You actually have to put some thought to bring it back. Well, what, what's a good example of that? Because sometimes you can't remember your phone number. It just shows you have to make an effort. Some of you say, oh my God, I can't remember. You have like a, you know, a space in your memory for some reason because it requires an effort to get your phone number. Even well-known things like your birthday, sometimes you forget it. And probably some of you forget your name from time to time. Now, there are two types of episode, or two types of explicit memories. Again, explicit memories require thinking. Episodic information, or episodic information, is personal memories. Your phone number, your address, your mother's name, your favorite color. Okay, episode is like think about like a TV series have episodes. Episodes deal with the, you know the characters of the people, all right? Their lives. Semantic information means general information. It's what everybody knows. So what's an example? If I ask you how many tires on a car, you say four. Everybody knows that. It's not personal to you, okay? If I said what's your birthday, that's episodic. If I asked you what's the capital of Michigan and you said Lansing. That's semantic or general knowledge. Everybody knows it, okay? Not just you. Now, implicit memories is the other type of long-term memory. Implicit means implied. Implied means this is the biggest thing. It doesn't require thought. Most of you do not have to think when you tie your shoes. It's an implicit memory. You've done it so many times that it becomes, so to speak, a habit, a routine. Now, implicit, the difference between, another difference between implicit and explicit, explicit are usually facts and figures. Implicit are usually procedures or routines, like how to shoot a basket. Nobody has to shoot, you know, remember how to shoot a basket. It's a routine. 
Okay, but if I asked you what would you know what was uh, somebody's point average in the NBA, that's a, a, a specific fact, and that you know an exact or explicit good way to remember it, fact. Now, this requires procedural information that builds into implicit memories. How do you tie your shoe? It's a procedure. How do you ride a bike? Procedure. How do you uh, you know dial a phone? Procedure. Most of you can dial a phone while you're watching TV. Why? Because it's a procedure. But the number you're dialing is an exact fact, exact meaning and explicit. That requires you know conscious thought. Now, a couple questions here. Mary is able to remember her mother's birthday. Remembering that date is an example of which type of memory? First way you look at this question. Does it require thought to remind you remember her mother's birthday? Yes, so that's explicit, right? Now, if it's explicit, that's broken into two categories: personal information. And general information. Personal means, most of you are looking at this, would say, well, that's an episode of that person's life, and that's you know what the answer is. Now, other types of long-term memory. Perspective, perspective memory is remembering to do something in the future. So when you say words like, I have to remember on Wednesday to call my mom and wish her a happy birthday, you are making a memory about something to do in the future. Okay, to, you know, for example, to mail out your college admissions on Friday. Now, retrospective, retro means old, is simply refers to remembering things, situations, or various events from the past. What you did three days ago. You know, what you got out of the test last month. Something that happened in the past. Okay? Now, how we organize long-term memory, which we've kind of talked about, but we'll just put this into terms. Hierarchical models based on similarities. When new information is encoded in a long-term memory, it's encoded with other similar information. This is an example of the parallel distributed processing model that we talked about. It's, in other words, it's tied into okay, other events. Now, semantic network, memories are stored through association. Now, a fire truck is associated with red. So if I said teacher, you associate that often with your favorite teacher, that name's going to always pop up. All right? It's associated. So if I said apple, you automatically think red. Automatically is priming. It's the unconscious process that refers to activating the associations present in the semantic model. I like to refer to this one as a balloon. You pull down the string, it could be attached to 15 balloons, okay, that are all tied to one string. So if I said right now, Carlton, and you went to Carlton, not only did one memory come back, 20 balloons came back of memories. Your teacher, your schedule, your favorite sport where your classes were. So in other words, hierarchic model refers to what we talked earlier is the concept of, you know, the categories, concepts. You put things into folders, all right? So in other words, all your information from school goes into a concept. So if I said again, review this, if I said what was your favorite class, you have a concept, a category of all your classes. Your favorite teacher would be your prototype or the one that comes to your, you know, mind the quickest. Now, <coughs> retrieval is like what I refer to as hitting open on a Word document. You're taking it out of storage. Now, retrieval cues are, key, are clues or hints that help trigger a long-term memory. Okay? So in other words, a retrieval cue would be like if I asked you, okay, if I said Sterling Heights High School, and you said what? And I said psychology class. Oh, Mr. McLean, I gave you a clue to what I wanted to hear the answer. So when somebody, for example, says, what did you do yesterday? And you go, what? They said at 4 o'clock. The time 4 o'clock is a retrieval cue. It triggers that memory. You go, oh yeah, I was at work. Now, retrieval cue failure is, let's say, that same example. I said, at 4 o'clock, you said, what? At 4 o'clock yesterday. And 4 o'clock does nothing for you. That retrieval cue, that clue or that hint fails to pull up the memory of what you did yesterday. So I have to come up with another retrieval cue. And I said, when you left the school and you went down 15. Now, let's say if I sit down 15 and you say, oh, 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 yeah, that's right, I had to go to work. I gave you another retrieval cue because the first one failed. <clears throat> now, tip of the tongue is an example of retrieval cue failure. Occurs when information is stored in long-term memory, but the retrieval cue is not strong enough. This often where you see tip of the tongue is with trying to name a song. You hear a song, you're like, oh, I know it, I know it. But the, the song, what, how much you've heard of it, is not strong enough to trigger the memory of the name of it. And often, go back to insight, you often come up with that answer just simply from stepping back, incubation. So you couldn't remember the name of the song in the first hour, 
then all of a sudden it hits you in fourth hour because you stepped away from the problem, and then it came back to you. Now, serial position effect refers to the fact that we have a tendency not to remember items in the middle of a list. <clears throat> so on a list, if I give you a list of grocery items, you're more prone to remember the first items and the last items, but forget the ones in the middle. Now, primacy effect is the first part of the list which people often do remember. So if you remember the first part of the list, that's called the primacy. If you remember the last part of the list, that's called the recency. Recency means in the rear. Good way to remember. Okay? Now, the von Restoff effect is remember an item in the middle of the list because it is unique. Alright? And that's called the von Restoff, like I said. But let's say I give you that grocery list, but in the middle of the list I said magazine, and the rest of it were fruits and vegetables. Well, because a magazine is unique and it's in the middle, you have more of a tendency to remember that than if I just simply had a whole list of vegetables. Now, some things we can extend to these. Multiple choice, people like that. You love your multiple choice questions because simply you can recognize the answer, right? Because they're all listed for you. So all those answers are simply retrieval cues. Fill in the blank are a little bit tougher. We call that cued recall because the question itself will cue the memory, all right? So obviously if I you know, ask you, William James was the blank psychologist, William James will cue the memory, which hopefully the word first will. Essay, free recall, no clues or, or hints to trigger information. This is tough, because if I said write all you know about psychology, I'm not giving you any retrieval cues or hints to pull back. It would be different if I gave you an essay with a bunch of you know, answers, you know, and I said availability heuristic, representative heuristic, anchoring heuristic. Those would all be you know, simply retrieval cues. But if I said just know, write everything you can about thinking, that would be tough, because I gave you no retrieval cues. Now, Factors that affect retrieval. Encoding specificity principle is a retrieval cue that is more effective when retrieval conditions are similar to those where, in fact, it was originally learned. And I know that's kind of fancy, but all of you can relate to it. An example of the encoding specificity principle is the context dependent memory. Context dependent refers to retrieving information in the same setting where the information was encoded. Perfect example of this context dependent memory. Context means you know, the context of like your bathroom. So you run out of toothpaste when you're brushing your teeth in the morning. And you remind yourself to simply stop on the way home. Now more than likely you're going to forget because you're out of your context. I guarantee you when you won't go back into that bathroom, go back into the bathroom where you originally put the thought into your memory, encoded the memory to, you know, pick up toothpaste, that's where it will hit you. You didn't think about it all day long because you weren't in the bathroom. You weren't in the same context. Now, other example of the encoding specificity principle, mood congruence effect. Similar emotions and moods will trigger, will act as retrieval cues. So when you're in a good mood, it's a retrieval cue for memories of other times you were in a good mood. That's why when people get into arguments, you know, obviously the anger is triggering all the other times they were angry. That's why they will say things, well, this reminds me of the time you did this, and the time you did this, and they go back into a person's, you know, history. Now, state-dependent memory is a person's internal state. For example, when I say internal state, like hunger is an internal state. So when you're hungry, hungry is going to be a retrieval cue for other times you were hungry. All right? Same as if you had alcohol in your system. It would be an internal state. It would also, you hear people often talk about other times they've been drinking. Okay? Because the alcohol is a retrieval cue. Now, good question here, people. Rosita is having a hard time remembering the material she learned in class and that she knew was going to be on the test. As she walked into her classroom on the day of the test, she immediately started to remember the forgotten content. This sudden occurrence can be explained through recency, context, primacy, retrieval, semantic. Is a classroom a context? Okay? Yeah. And so, in other words, you know, you can relate to it. The answer is B, context effect. But most of you, if I said to you right now in class and I said, don't forget your yellow book tomorrow. You'll remember it, then you'll forget, and then when you walk into class the next day, the classroom will trigger that retrieval cue. Now, flashball memories are significant events that add personal meaning, emotional. And we'll talk about that, but obviously when the amygdala is involved in forming a memory, you're going to add emotion. So obviously funerals, traumatic events, most people remember 9-11 because it was emotional. And that's a flashball memory. It's very vivid. It's almost like a picture in your brain, very accurate. Now, 
constructing memories. Like I said, we talked about the PDP. All right. This is simply other memories are integrated with existing memories. New information existed, you know, is integrated or weaved into your past memories, and that's your semantic and episodic memories. Okay. Now, schemas. We already talked about this one. Mental organizations of information. Okay. Of a car. You know, obviously a mental organization includes the tires. Now, schema is the one thing I want to say with this, why I'm bringing it up now, is they can lead to memory distortions. If you have, for example, a schema of your kitchen, then it's going to be hard to imagine other people's kitchens because your original schema will always interfere with it. So when you think of, if I said kitchen, you will already, always think of yours, which will make it hard to understand that there are different types of kitchens out there because you always originally think of yours. So if I said, what's your schema of a car, and you have a car come up, it'll be hard for you to imagine a car with three wheels, because you always will base it on your first original schema. Now, continuing uh, chapter four, and we're talking about constructing memories, and the person who's most known with constructing memories is Elizabeth Loftus, and she basically researched how memories are not only constructed, but how memories can be altered. And one of the things that she's most known for is something called the misinformation effect, which is simply by definition, if you provide misleading information to someone, it causes them to reconstruct their memory. In other words, it causes them to rethink their memory. So if, if somebody was sure that they came in, uh, came in at 10 o'clock at night, and you said, no, you were here at 11, by presenting misleading evidence, you make them think. Well, when you make them think, that word think, makes them reorganize their information. Now this is very similar to what we talked about with Piaget's theory with the term accommodation. Accommodation, remember the CC stands for change. So when you present information, it changes their schema. So by presenting misleading information, which a lot of times, you know, that's sometimes, you know, lawyering, what you see in the courtrooms, by questioning somebody, that purely questioning that person makes them reorganize that memory and then all of a sudden they don't know because the memory has been reconstructed. Now, she had a, a famous example that basically kind of justified the misinformation effect. When several people saw a car accident, by simply asking or using a different word in the question made people rethink their memory. So, in other words, in this example, when they asked people how fast were the cars going when they bumped into each other, the people reported slower speeds. But when they asked other people who saw the car accident and said, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? By using the word smash, they reported faster speeds. So even though all these people saw the same accident, by giving them misleading information, like an example just using different wording, you know, gave them you know, different answers or it reconstructed their memories in terms of what they, what they remember. Now, Marcia Johnson developed a, a, a term called source monitoring or source amnesia. And it refers to explaining where memories originate from. I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but most people often cannot remember where or when they heard something. So when somebody says, they're telling a story and say, well, where did that happen? A lot of times what you know, Arcia Johnson found out is that we don't, put memory, we don't put the time or place into our memories. That's why a lot of people say, I don't remember when I heard that. I know I heard that yesterday. Okay? They don't have an exact time because that usually doesn't get formed into the memory. Now, Herman Appenhaus studied simply the forgetting curve, or he came up with the forgetting curve, and he wanted to know how fast we forget information. Now, he used himself as a subject and memorized nonsense syllables. All right? Nonsense syllables, which basically they don't have meaning. If something is like an elaborate rehearsal where we have meaning to it, of course we're going to remember it longer. But in terms of just facts and figures that don't have a lot of meaning or kind of nonsense, he tested his memory over a period of 20 minutes to 30 days. Now, when he plotted his data on what's called the Eppenhaus forgetting curve, he stated much of what is learned is forgotten. However, what we don't forget right away, we have a tendency to remember for a long period of time. So if you were in a second hour class, and you get to your third hour, and you can remember several things that was several things you learned in second hour. What Eppenhaus said is you're going to remember those things for a long period of time, probably the end of the semester. However, if you got the third hour and you can't remember what the lecture was about, then that information is gone. So whatever we're going to remember, okay, we are going to remember because it stands the test of time. 
Whatever we forget, we will forget right away. So if we don't learn it right away, we will forget it right away. Now, typical question, what psychologists believe that forgetting of information will occur rapidly at first and then will level off? Okay, most of you probably can remember that, just to reinforce it. Most of you are saying that's letter A, Herman Appenhaus. Now, in terms of probably one of the things that's the most confusing in this chapter is to kind of keep straight proactive and retroactive interference. Now, interference theory, okay, basically what it says is memories can interfere with each other. Now, what this causes is one memory interferes with another memory or the, rem or the remembering of that memory. Now, when you look at the first one, retroactive interference, a new memory interferes with you remembering an older memory. Okay? So retroactive, retro means old. So right off the bat, when you see retroactive, that means you cannot remember something old. So in other words, what the example of this? You're learning your new locker combination, and it prevents you from remembering your old locker combination. So to put that in dialogue, you get a new locker combination your senior year. Somebody asks you, what was your locker com your junior year? And you say, I can't remember it. I keep on thinking of my, you know, my new locker comp. Your new locker comp is preventing you from remembering your old. So retroactive, once you see the word retro, it simply means you cannot remember something old. Now pro means new. So proactive interference is an older memory interferes with your remembering of a new memory. So you look at the example. You keep on dialing your old cell phone. Your old cell phone number is preventing you from remembering something new, and that'd be your new cell phone. And this, most people often experience proactive interference. Their friend calls them up and says, this is my new cell number. Two days later, they go to call their friend, and they accidentally dial the first three or four digits of their old, lock or old cell phone. So in other words, they can't learn the new cell phone because they keep on dialing the old cell phone number. Now, encoding failure, encoding means to put into memory. So encoding failure occurs when information was never entered into long-term memory. In other words, it never went from short-term to long-term memory. That's encoding failure. Encoding, again, is putting in. Now, here's a good example. Steve can only remember his old locker comp. He keeps forgetting his new locker comp. So when you see a question like this, and this is obviously dealing with retroactive and proactive interference, you ask yourself, what can't? Steve remember. And you look at the question, he keeps forgetting his new locker comp. Which word means new? Retroactive or proactive? And you should write or you should remember the right answer was C, proactive interference. You cannot remember something new. Okay? Now, just to go back to this question, this is typically what you're going to see on the national exam. They are going to try to confuse you a little bit. So you always ask yourself, what can't the person remember? If that was, he couldn't remember something old, it's retroactive. But in this case, it was proactive interference. Now, in terms of motivated forgetting, okay, suppression is a conscious effort to forget something. So when you say the words, I don't want to talk about what happened yesterday, you're making a conscious effort not to remember it. That's suppression. The difference is, and this goes with Freudian theory, Repression is an unconscious forgetting information. Now this often involves you know, traumatic events from the past. Repression is it happens on its own. Now it's kind of a mystery how this happens. Certain people cannot remember certain events that happen at particular times because of what was associated with it. Psychologists don't understand quite why they can't remember it, but simply it happened unconsciously. So no matter what, they cannot remember it. Okay. Now, decay theory suggests that people forget memories that they are not actively using. So when a memory is formed, it creates a memory trace in the brain, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. And this memory trace is like a path. And according to decay, uh, decay theory, you have to keep this path up. Okay, you have to keep on walking on this path. Now, if you don't walk on this path, then eventually the path starts to disappear. Okay? So I always use, you know, teach this like a little trail in the woods. If you walk back and forth on the trail, you keep the trail clear of debris. But if you don't walk on the trail, the trail becomes cluttered and disappears. In other words, it, it's overgrown with plants. Now, some people disagree with this theory. 
Okay, so let's say you had a phone number from when you were five years old. And you move and you obviously don't dial that number for 15, 16 years. Yeah, you might not remember it, but one day you might go back to your childhood home or see your childhood number written on a wall. And right away when you see it, you recognize it. So even though you forgot it, you didn't think about it for 15 years, by just seeing that number in an old notebook or somewhere else, instantly retrieves that memory. What that proves is the memory is still there. It just did, it didn't disappear like the decay theory said. Now, Carl Ashey, you know, did uh, research on the biological basis for memory. In other words, he looked at the areas of the brain responsible for it. And what he discovered from researching rats is that memory is not localized or simply particular to one area of the brain. In other words, several areas of the brain are responsible for the formation of memories. Now, evolutionary psychologists might say that's because if one particular area of the brain got damaged, and let's say that one particular area was in charge of housing all your memories, then your memories would be gone forever. So what Lashy basically said, it's like backing up you know, your information on your computer to a variety of things, like a flash drive, like USB or whatever. So in other words, if your hard drive went down, you still have all your data backed up on an exterior drive. Now, Donald Hebb looked at the formation of memories. In other words, how memories are formed, what they look like in the brain. And what he basically saw was a path, like what I just described as a memory trace. And how this path gets to be formed, which is called long-term potentiation, is that every single time you learn something, certain neurons okay, are responsible for that learning of that new information. And each time, those neurons fire. In other words, an action potential travels between the synapses of those neurons. What basically happens is the dendrites start to grow in size. And when the dendrites start to grow in size, what happens is the synapse becomes very, very short. And so it kind of creates what a path is. So let's say you had, these are two neurons. As the dendrites of this one neuron start to grow, because let's say you're learning you know, a phone number, what happens is the dendrites start to grow. The gap between the synapse, or I'm sorry, the gap between this axon and these dendrites becomes smaller. The neurotransmitter doesn't have to travel as fast. So when you're first learning something, why it takes you a little bit of time to remember it, it's because the gap between those, the gap between those neurons is large. But over time, as you practice it and keep those neurons firing, the dendrites become larger, the space or the synapse becomes smaller, and you're able to come up with the answer a lot quicker. And that, again, is long-term potentiation. Long-term means a memory, potentiation is a long-term for action potential. So the more action potentials that fire, the bigger the dendrites get, the smaller the synapse gets, the shorter amount of time you have to wait to give the answer. Now, the hippocampus is the one area of the brain that simply explicit memories. And remember, explicit memories are memories that require conscious effort, like facts and figures. And just to review it, explicit memories have two different types. Semantic memories are memories that are general knowledge, like a car has four tires. And then simply episodic memories are an example of explicit memories, but they're more personal, okay? Like when you graduated from high school. Now, all these memories travel through the hippocampus. And what they've isolated is the neurotransmitters that are responsible, okay, for forming these memories are glutamate and acetylcholine. Now, this would be a review from the developmental psych chapter, but Alzheimer's disease has been connected with acetylcholine. When acetylcholine starts to disintegrate or disappear, that's what produces the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Now, in terms of amnesia, there's two different types of amnesia. Amnesia of general direction is the inability to remember something. And that could be from a variety of factors. If it's due to some physical trauma, like getting bumped on the head or falling down the stairs, this is called retrograde amnesia. And retrograde amnesia is you cannot remember, especially episodic memories, like facts and figures, what's your name, what's your mom's name, and so on. You cannot remember those memories from the past. Now, in time, when the brain heals, the bump goes away, then usually, usually, not every time, but usually, all the memories will come back. So it could be a couple days, it could be a week. Now, with antigrade amnesia, this was similar to 51st dates, where you cannot form new memories. 
And this is usually damage to the hippocampus. So we just learned the hippocampus is where simply explicit memories are being formed. The path that they go through is you know, going through the hippocampus. If there's damage to the hippocampus, then the inability or the ability to form new memories is just not going to occur. And it is very similar to that movie. It is just simply the memories will never enter into long-term memory. Now, there was a patient in HM who had severe seizures. And as a result, they had to remove his hippocampus. And HM was, not, was never able to form an explicit memory after that particular point. However, it did not affect his implicit memories. Implicit, remember, don't require thinking. How you dribble a basketball, type on a computer, you know, tie your shoes. So what this proved is that memories basically, like what was just discussed, are simply localized to several different areas of the brain instead of one. Now, good question here. Ray hurt his head in a car accident and has been experiencing problems recalling past events. Ray's doctors told his parents that Ray may be suffering from. Well, what type of amnesia is due to a physical injury? Okay? And most of you looking through the list, antigrade, misinformation effect, incomplete schemas, retrieval failure, or retrograde amnesia, most of you probably looked at and you picked Letter E, retrograde amnesia, which is the inability to recall past events, especially explicit memories. Now, this is kind of an outline of some of the areas of the brain and what they're responsible for. All right, as we talked about the hippocampus, the key thing is that's where new explicit memories are formed. Okay? Now, cerebellum, this is important. This stores, you know, memories that involve movement and coordination used in implicit memories. Okay, so the back of the head is what is responsible for you performing actions, again, implicit, without thinking. Now, the amygdala, remember that's the emotional part of the brain. That encodes the emotional elements of the memory. So a lot of times, flashbulb memories, like for example, 9-11 or other uh, you know, types of emotional events, that's where those memories are processed. The medial temporal lobe, remember temporal is auditory encodes new explicit memories to long-term memory. It's part of that path. Now, the prefrontal cortex, remember prefrontal is where you put things, your prefrontal cortex, the front part of your brain, is in charge of planning and reasoning. And this involves, obviously, processes memories involving a sequence. So when you give the events of yesterday and you put them in order, well, first I did this, next I went here, that's your prefrontal cortex responsible for forming the sequence of that memory. Now, last part of this, mnemonics. Mnemonics are memory aids. Okay? There's a couple, and some of them I'm sure you're well familiar with. Acronyms, most of us use. HOMES. Okay? Many people living in Michigan use the word HOMES, or the acronym, I should say, HOMES, to recall the five great lakes here on Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. Link method involves linking a mental image with the content. That is, remember. Remember to bring home a book by remembering to do your homework. So in other words, what the link method is, is you link one you know, type of memory with another type. So you have the image of doing homework, you link it with getting your book out of your locker. That's going to be your, your way of remembering it. Method of loci is associating an item with the actual place that the item is stored. People use method of loci to go grocery shopping. Yours truly is one of those people. I will look in my fridge before I go grocery shopping, and so then when I get to a certain product in the grocery store, let's say it's bread, I picture the area of the kitchen where the bread is supposed to be, and I remember if it was there. And then simply if it wasn't, then I buy bread. Might not be the most reliable, but it saves you from writing everything out. Okay, that concludes the lecture.